To launch our partnership with Learn Liberty, I'm joined by someone who's no stranger to explaining complex ideas. Randy Barnett is a lawyer, an author, and a professor at Georgetown University, where he teaches constitutional law. Randy, welcome to the Rubin Report. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on in. You're staying at the very fancy uh, Chateau Marmont, and you made it all the way over here to where we are by yeah, the airport. Had to fight the traffic, but it's worth it. All right, very good. Well, there, there's so much that I want to talk to you about because the things that you study and that you're an expert in are exactly the things that I've been talking about on this show for quite some time. So it's nice to have a, an expert with me. So first off, let, let's do constitutional stuff first. What's so great about the U.S. Constitution? Well, what's great about the U.S. Constitution is that it is the law that governs those who govern us. It is not the law that governs us. We are not necessarily bound by the Constitution as individuals. But it is a law that er each and every person who's an officer of the U.S. government, including state officers, take an oath to support and enforce and obey that law that governs them. So it is a charter that subjects rulers to the rule of law, assuming they follow it, which is what they're supposed to do. Right. So they're supposed to follow it. I don't know that they always follow it, or I'm sure they don't always follow it. How come when the president takes the oath, he does it on the Bible instead of the Constitution. Wouldn't that make more sense? Well, there, an oath is supposedly a, a, an act of faith. It's, an act of, it's, a, it's, it's asking you to be judged uh, by God, and God holds you to your oath. So it is, it is what makes, uh, the Bible is what makes an oath uh, morally significant to many people. All people uh, in this country have always been offered the alternative of affirming rather than taking an oath. So anybody who wants to affirm rather than take an oath is free to do so. Right. But everything being equal, I suspect you'd rather have someone put their hand on the, on the Constitution when they're yes. swearing in, right? I mean, yes. that, that ultimately is the... Right. That's, what, the, the that's what they are making an oath to follow, and, uh, and, and they should follow it. And actually what that means is that they're not allowed to change it. If, that's, if, the, if the Constitution is the law that governs those who govern us, then they can no more change the law that governs them by themselves mm -hmm. than we can change the laws that govern us without going through the legislative process. So, for example, we can't change the speed limits that govern us. We, there's no living speed limit that we can adjust depending on circumstances, and they right. should not be able to change the rules that govern them without going through the amendment process. But that's not, of course, the way they play the game. Yeah, so we'll get into how they play the game in a little bit. Is there one particular part of the Constitution that you think really like just nails it perfectly? Is there something that you really see as just the the underpinning of everything else? Well, I'm known for having a, a strong affinity for the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, which says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That is an expressed affirmation of the retained rights or the natural rights of the people that first come rights and then comes government. It's mm -hmm. an express affirmation of that. And then the 14th Amendment repeats something like that where it says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So that applies then the Constitution of state officers in a way that it wasn't applied before. And that includes both the natural rights that the Ninth Amendment refers to and also affirmative rights that are in the Bill of Rights as well. So those are my two favorite parts of the Constitution. Yeah, so both of those parts, they really deal with the individual, right? I mean, it really comes down to the individual person and that the state should not infringe on your individual rights to do what you see fit within the laws. Yeah, so when I say first come rights and then comes government, I do mean first come the rights of individuals. The Declaration of Independence, which was the founding document of the country, then we had two tries at government, but bef to make a country, the Declaration declares the country we are, it says that all persons are, all persons are endowed with certain inalienable rights among which are the life, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each one of those is individual rights, mm -hmm. life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And the next sentence of the Declaration says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So it tells you first come rights of individuals, then comes government to secure these rights. The entire philosophy of the country and the, and the Constitution are summed up in those two sentences of the Declaration. Yeah, so our Founding Fathers really were individualists at heart, right? I mean, when they were framing this entire thing and when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and then when the Constitution came, their, their whole concept was that if we can take care of the individual first, 
that the rest, that the government will have to behave in a way that will always respect that. Yes, first come individuals, first come rights, but individuals are not atoms. They were not atomistic individuals. Neither do I believe contemporary libertarians are atom atomistic individuals. The reason why we have rights and the reason why we need rights is because we do live in society with others, and rights are the way that define our, the rights are the way we define our jurisdiction as opposed to our fellow citizens' jurisdiction, the way nations define their jurisdictions so that one nation doesn't interfere with the internal affairs of other nations and we don't get wars. Mm -hmm. That's what rights are for. In society with others, each of us needs our own jurisdiction to make our choices, and that jurisdiction needs to be defined relative to other people's welfare as well. So we are individual individuals, but not atomistic individuals. Right. So let's back up to the Declaration of Independence for a second, because the line about the pursuit of happiness, there's some comic that I heard do a funny bit, I can't remember who it was, that that line, that we're the only country that has <clears throat> something like that, that you are here to pursue your own happiness, that puts a lot of pressure on us, that we're supposed to pursue happiness, where a lot of other governments, they're not, they don't really exist to have us pursue happiness, they give, you know, it's to pursue the government's means or to make more product or something like that. So that really is a unique line that our forefathers put in there that really has helped spread freedom, right? Well, it's the ultimate end. I mean, rights themselves are not ends in themselves. Rights are the means to the pursuit of happiness while living in society with others. So libertarians and classical liberals generally, though we believe in individual rights, do not believe that rights are the end of everything. Rights are simply a means by which individuals are able to pursue happiness without unduly interfering with the ability of other individuals to pursue happiness as well. And that formulation by Jefferson was not unique to him. George Mason, uh, several weeks before the Declaration was written, George Mason wrote the, Declaration, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and he also put happiness uh, and safety as the ultimate end. The pursuit of happiness and safety is the ultimate ends of society. Yeah, when you think about the people that wrote these documents, and then you look at our political system today, Ugh. we'll get into them later, so let's not go too deep on, on what's going on today. Don't but, depress me but, this morning. It's a beautiful sunny day <laughs> in LA. I'm at the Chateau Marmont, and now you're gonna try to bring me down. Don't bring, bring me down, Dave. Uh, well, all right, so let's, for now, I'll bring you down in about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. But for now, let's focus on just those specific people, the, the founding fathers, really. I mean, do you consider them, were, that they were modern day geniuses really? Or did it, was it just a function of they were escaping a monarchy basically, trying to create a system and that it, it was sort of thrust upon them? Or, or maybe there isn't one answer, it depends on each particular person. I, I, I mean, I really don't know the answer to this. I don't think I've ever been asked this question before, but I, I, I would say they are better educated than we were, than we are. That, I don't think they were geniuses. I don't think they're natively smarter than we are. I just think they have a much better edu they had a much better education in um, both their primary education and in college. They learned they read all the classical writers, um, and they just knew more facts and they knew more theory than we know today. Than most people today, you know, we watch our TV and we we watch reality TV. We watch uh, you know we watch the wonderful dramas that are on TV. I don't want to knock TV. I'm yeah. actually big on TV. Frankly, <laughs> I'm a big TV guy. Yeah, I've yeah. Always a lot been. of good stuff on now. Nobody's and, and not even you know I became that. a lawyer because of the Defenders, which was a television show that came out in the '60s. So I'm totally big on TV. But the truth is, we're not as well educated. I certainly didn't get. Learn, learn in high school what I could have learned, and I didn't even learn in college what I might have learned. They knew more than we know. That's, they weren't better people than we are by any means, but yeah. they, were, they knew more than we know. Yeah, this is a total sidebar, but I'm curious if you watch Boston Legal by any chance. I tend not to watch any legal shows because I think they're stupid. <laughs> Um, and, and so, I, I mean, they don't, I used to be a criminal prosecutor in Chicago, yeah. so I know what it feels like to be in the legal system, and none of them ring true. The, right. one, the only one recently, uh, I mean, the, you know, the wire is famously, you know, that rings true, by the way, about what law enforcement is like. But sure. this new one, The Night Of, on HBO, mm -hmm. totally, rings totally true. There's a few cl plot elements that didn't work, that aren't quite right. But by and large, that's the way the criminal justice system and the legal system feels. So you're telling me the truth of a, a real trial lawyer is that it doesn't always get resolved in an hour? Is that how it works? Because well, I thought it was always resolved in one day. Is that not really? I'm not gonna have to. You're you're right. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> With commercial breaks. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. No, actually, um, the reality of the criminal justice system, if you work in it, is better than TV. 
<laughs> better than until recently that better than TV could show you it, the reality of the nitty gritty of how you navigate the criminal justice system uh, is more interesting yeah. actually than what they depict on television. Yeah, I re I mentioned Boston Legal because it was one of the few legal shows that I watch, and I thought they actually did such a nice job each week of laying out a lot of the prints. Each week they took a principle and they wrapped it around some trial that didn't really have much to do with it, but that you got some sort of message at the end, which I thought was really uh, nice. That, you know, and Law and Order, I'm told, I'm, I can't bear to watch these shows, but <laughs> I, I'm told that the law uh, is accurate. In fact, I have done consulting for The Good Wife because my former trial partner in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office is their principal legal consultant. And I'm told The Good Wife, for example, has very accurate law. Yeah. And I did consult with them on a couple shows that involve the Constitution. Um, but whether they get the law right and whether they get the ambiance of how people act and how people talk to each other, that's two different things. Right. And also it's your day job. So sometimes I would imagine you want to watch some monsters at night or something else. That's... I, st I still like good cop shows yeah. and stuff, but it has to ring true to me. And yeah. that stuff just is too melodramatic. People don't give speeches to each other <laughs> in the criminal justice system. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so let's back up to something you mentioned, which was classical liberals and libertarians. Now, I would consider myself a classical liberal, and I've watched what I think is the sort of destruction of the left over the last two years. It's been very sad for me and one of the things I've been talking about a lot on the show. What, what is the difference to you between a classical liberal and a libertarian? Well, classical liberal is a larger ca category, and libertarians are a subset within classical liberals. They're not different things. One is a more narrow subset. Libertarians, I think, the, way, the, the difference is libertarians believe in a, a few basic sets of rights, of individual rights, and the more radical a libertarian you are, the less you think need to be added to that basic set of rights in order for society to do well. So there's the right of you know, property and contract and self-defense and restitution. These are the basic rights that people have, and the more radical libertarian you are, the more you think we can just get by on those rights and we shouldn't add anything else. And right. then people think, oh, well, no, you need this and you need that, you need this other thing. And then that makes them somewhat less radical. But as long as they believe that the core of society is the individual um, living in society with other people, um, so there's a society as well, as long as they believe that these individual rights are the core and that in some sense first come rights and then comes government, then that puts you in the liberal tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and we call it the classical liberal tradition to distinguish it from the term liberal, which got taken over by the progressives. When progressives got a bad name after World War I, right? because progressives, they had their own, they were called progressives, and then right. they got a really bad name associated with World War I when Woodrow Wilson, the famous progressive, is locking up dissenters and putting, and putting Eugene Debs behind bars, who was the socialist candidate for president. It got a bad name, so they mm -hmm. started calling themselves liberals because that was a good thing to be called. Right. And then they gave liberals a bad name. So right. then we can't call ourselves liberal because they call themselves liberal. Yeah, don't you hate the label part of it? Because I find that we to talk about these things, we need these labels. And yet at the same time, nobody really wants to be labeled and it's usually limiting because a lot of us have things that, that bleed into the other category. Well, I went through a phase in which I didn't call myself a libertarian. I called myself a classical liberal. And uh, in fact, the Institute for Humane Studies, who you know is sponsoring this or has something to do with this video, yeah. they had that as part of their thing, which was we were liberals, we were classical liberals, and I found it confused people. And they would say, "Well, what is that?" Yeah. And they would, and it would make it, it would make me defense, it make me seem like I'm defensive, like I'm hiding what I am. And I finally realized, you know, libertarian actually doesn't have a bad valence anymore. It used to be really weird. I'm old really? enough to remember when the term was like really weird. I think it still has a bit of a I, weird. Connotation to the to the masses. I mean, did you watch? I'm sure you saw it, or maybe you attended the Libertarian Convention. It was uh, it was quite a show. Well, I saw it on live stream. Yeah, and I thought it was actually well conducted. I didn't see the part where the crazy people came. Well, the on. guy would know, you know. Yeah, but I think stripped that was, on stage. Yeah, and, I didn't see that part. Yeah, I think yeah, most of it. It was much more serious and businesslike than the other convention I had just watched, which was the Republican <laughs> convention and the, and the right. Democratic convention. Yeah. So, uh, but. Um, I don't think it has the kind of wacky connotation it used to have. In fact, why, that's why some people call themselves libertarians who aren't, because it makes them seem cooler. Right. Uh, so, uh, therefore, I just embrace it now. So I don't call myself, I mean, I am a classical liberal, but that's not what I call myself. I just own up to the fact that libertarian is the best descriptor of me, and I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. How does a party, like the Libertarian Party, that really is about the individual, how should they, because this is where I think they haven't been successful, 
is how do you take people where it's about the individual and really get them to unify? So when I was watching the, the convention, for example, you know, they had people up there screaming about um, you know, either legalizing all drugs, which I could be convinced is fine, but more things like you know, no driver's licenses, things like that, where it's such a non-starter for so many people. Like, it just seems so silly. Like, to get in a car, you could kill a lot of people if you don't know how to do it. We should have a license. Like, that seems, within the libertarian construct, I think you can make an argument for that. How do you think they can untie themselves from some of the most um, th things that are sort of out there at this point? Or do you think that maybe they don't have to? You're asking... You you want to talk about like how the Libertarian Party should be made better? Is that is well, that well, basically, yeah. That I so I heard them talking about like the driver's license thing, and I was like, guys, you're you're arguing about such petty little things that you're completely missing what the bigger argument is. Well, that's that would true. be an easier way to ask. I guess. I mean, I I have been I I was very I very proudly voted for Libertarian the Libertarian Party candidate in when they first started a party. I went to the New York convention in the seventies the presidential nominating convention. So I really liked the fact that there was an LP when it got started, but I was quickly, uh, I, quick, I quickly came of the opinion, even into the 80s and the 90s, that it was a big mistake to have a Libertarian Party. And the reason was, uh, and I got invited to Libertarian Party conventions to debate people on whether there should be a Libertarian Party. And the reason was <laughs> that I thought, um, first of all, we have a two-party system based on the voting rules that currently are in existence. And to have a Libertarian Party, Basically, a third party will basically cost the party that's closest to it votes mm -hmm. and help the party that's farthest from it. Mm -hmm. It'll drain votes from the party that's closest to it. That's not a good thing. Right. The second thing that makes it not a good thing is that to the extent people want to be political activists, they don't want to be professors and they don't want to be writers, they want to be political activists, and you instead of saying, okay, go out and find the party you feel best about, the Democrats or Republicans, and make that party more libertarian, it drains those people into a libertarian ghetto party that's never going to win. And, say, and, and that, by definition, makes the two major parties less libertarian at the margin because libertarians are invited out of that party. Right, if there was a law that said they had to go into the third party, libertarians would resent it, but they segregate themselves. So for these two reasons, I was against the libertarian party. Now this year, of all years, the year in which they may not, there may not be a lesser of two evils. There's always a lesser of two evils, right? right. But there's no natural law that says there has to be a lesser of two evils. They right. might just be bad in their own way, equally bad. Yeah. This is the year when a third party like the Libertarian Party really, sh they, this was they're the in existence for, right? Don't tell me about they're going to get 10% of the vote this year because it's going to help in the future. This is the future. The Libertarian Party has been around for 40 years or 30 years, however long they've been around. Mm -hmm. This is their year, and they, and they don't seem to be up to the challenge this year of fielding um, a, a candidate that's genuinely attractive. Whether Gary Johnson is better than Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, that's a reasonable conclusion one can reach because mm -hmm. they're so bad. But we shouldn't have to settle for that. We should have actually, they, if they hadn't been able to field, a, if they're not able to field a candidate this year, yeah. when, which should be their year, then they're never going to be able to. Really? Yeah, I did a video a couple of weeks ago about why I wanted to at least support Gary Johnson until the debates. Let's at least get one other voice in the debate. I think he and, should be in the debates. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's a rig, that's another version of the rig okay. system for two-party system. Mm -hmm. the, the, the two parties got together and they created this debate commission that they won't, you know, that, that has to, that creates a threshold to let another party into the debate. So to basically screen out other parties, it's working very well for the two parties. It's working it's a, really yeah, well. It's, for it's another reason, but I think Gary Johnson should definitely be in the debates. But I really think that the Libertarian Party, uh, this was their year to nominate a real contender to be president, and uh, I don't think they've successfully done that. Right, so without getting too, too far down the rabbit hole of Gary Johnson, I mean, you would argue that as a libertarian, he isn't libertarian enough, basically, to draw the people, right? So like something with the, with the cake and the, the gay marriage thing, like he's for forcing the private business owner to bake the cake. That seems very silly to me. I am okay with a libertarian party candidate who's not purely or perfectly libertarian. First of all, almost nobody is because everybody disagrees about what it means to be a perfectly <laughs> right. pure libertarian, right? Exactly. So, but I'm okay with them making political compromises. You know, I work for Senator Rand Paul. He is a libertarian. Uh, he may not be perfectly libertarian in every respect, although I think he's very libertarian, and I work for him on his presidential campaign. Um, and so I like him. Yeah. Uh, I wish he were the 
candidate. Sure. <laughs> I wanted him to be the candidate. Well, he was right? the only one that was different. I mean, I guess Trump was different too than the rest of them, but Rand Paul was the only one with really But libertarians ideas. dumped all over him while he was running as not being libertarian enough, and he was too libertarianish. and look who they've got, who they picked. Right. But anyway, the point is, is I'm okay with somebody who's not perfectly libertarian. It's just that in this case, Gary Johnson, and I don't want to dump on him because he still is better than the other two. Um, <laughs> in this case, Gary Johnson has run away from libertarian positions that would actually appeal to disaffected Republican voters, yeah. but Gary Johnson is running to his left, even where genuinely libertarian positions like gun rights, for example, um, uh, would help him to the right. Um, he, he doesn't, that's not where his heart is. That's not where he's running. I mean, look, he's being who he is, fine. But that's, this is the year in which you could actually compete for Republican voters, and he really is drawing more support from Hillary, I think, right. the polls have shown. So in a lot of respects, basically, he's to the left, but he's framing that within a couple libertarian principles, yeah. like gay marriage and marijuana and a couple other things. I, I don't want to, I don't know what's in his heart. Yeah. I don't really know him that well. And so I don't want to characterize what he really believes and what, sure. he, what he is, but he's running to his left. I mean, there are people uh, who are not libertarians and very critical libertarians say, look, you know, this candidacy is revealing libertarians as being basically leftists. Mm -hmm with a few, with a leftist who believe in the free market or something. Right. So that's what they are. I don't think that is what libertarians are. Uh, but I have to say that Gary Johnson is somewhat playing to stereotype. Interesting, that is interesting. So a couple times you've mentioned the two party system and sort of the rigged piece of this thing. I think that people think that it's somehow in our system, maybe even written in the constitution that we're only supposed to have two parties. That has nothing to do with the constitution. Actually correct? parties themselves didn't originally have anything to do with the Constitution. Yeah. Parties, part, a, a term party was a negative thing. Democracy was a negative term at the time of the founding. Democracy had the same valence as demagogue has today. Hmm. Party had the same valence as partisan has today. Party was a faction. You're, the founders were against parties. They set up the Electoral College to select presidents from just people who people knew. It wasn't going to be parties. But it turned into a party system very, very early on. So. And it maybe it needed to. Maybe maybe the founders were wrong about this, and that mm -hmm. in fact people need to organize themselves if they disagree, and organize themselves into groups and associate. And but it doesn't necessarily have to be a two-party system. But there are things about our voting system. It's basically winner take all, first past the post voting. Which if you get fifty-one percent, you get the entire office. Mm -hmm. You don't get fifty-one percent of the office. You get the whole office. Right. That means you uh, parties need to get to fifty-one percent. And that means they basically have to put coalitions together of voters to get to 51%. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a parliamentary system, you can have isolated parties and then to form a government, then you put, you them, all put them all together. So that it's a different system and that yeah. leads to two parties or it leads to a few, a handful of parties. Um, but in addition to that, the parties have in fact rigged the voting rules to, in, to, to, uh, to entrench themselves. So for example, there's all kinds of restrictions as to who can get on the ballot mm -hmm. in different places that privilege the, the existing two parties. Yeah, I heard a lot of the Bernie people saying during the primaries, well, the primaries were rigged, and now we know that the DNC definitely was doing some things to do that. But one of the things that I saw people were upset about was that in certain states that they didn't have open primaries in every, in every state. Now, I would argue you shouldn't have open primaries because then you could have people that you know are not going to vote for the presidential candidate of that party purposely load the, the ticket, you know, load the voting system in the, in the primaries. Um, do you see that as a, as a legitimate problem? The whole primary system is a problem. The whole system the, we have today it was basically invented by the left, the, this part of the Democratic Party in the wake of the McGovern uh, situation in, in the 70s. And then the Republican Party just took on board this primary system that the Democrats had invented without yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, wait, can we pause there for a sec? So the, the Democrats did that because basically the party leaders wanted to make sure that McGovern, that there would be an out pretty much, right? Right, right. I mean, they, you know, they would pick Hubert Humphrey, whatever, whoever it would be. And so the radicals in the Democratic Party wanted to open up the Democratic Party. Um, so that more progressives could get nominated in the future. And it's really worked out pretty much for the left of the Democratic Party. The left has taken over the Democratic Party from what it was when I was a kid, mm -hmm. which was a mix of liberals and leftists. 
Um, and that, but the Republican Party just took on board the same voting rules mm -hmm. and the same open primary, or even the fact that there would be primaries. Primaries were not all, not every state had primaries in the past, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Republicans really need, and actually both parties should, but at least the Republicans need to completely rethink how they select their president, state by state. And I know a, uh, someone I co-authored with, Jay Cost, who works for the Weekly Standard, wrote a piece um, about how to redo the primary system. I can't give the exact citation. I think it was in the Atlantic or it might have been in the nation. Maybe it was in the nation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, th I thought it made a lot of sense. But Republicans really need to rethink how they select presidents.